And this is the man in the building, founder of Wavetable, future info learning expert, and your host for the workshop on workshops, the last and definite one you'll ever need. Put your hands together for Howard Gray over there in New York City. Howard, the mic is yours. You run the show. Thank you, Felix. Uh, thanks, everyone. Glad to be here. Uh, just to make sure, can everyone hear me okay? Can you give me a thumbs? Yes. Okay. First obstacle overcome. Um, I'm moving house tomorrow, and unfortunately my, my Vuvuzelas and my kazoo are both in a box, so I can't bring them out, but normally I would. So, uh, as mentioned, today is gonna to be highly interactive. Uh, we are gonna be going into a journey into workshops, the path towards workshop greatness for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. So, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, I'm gonna try and minimize me talking, because as we'll find out, workshops are as much about doing as anything else. So I'm gonna share my screen second obstacle of the day. Hopefully you can see something. Yes, everyone got that, yes. Okay, we're gonna get straight into it. Okay, so Felix kind of mentioned in my intro, um, I have an eclectic career is probably a fair thing to say. I spent most of my teenage years either in detention, working in a record store or promoting semi-legal raves in the woods. That's a whole other story. Um, but I did make it through school. and I did make it into doing more legal activities and uh, spent most of my kind of 20s and 30s working in digital agencies in London, which is where I'm from originally. I ran two entertainment companies. And then I started working with bigger corporate companies as an educator. So believe it or not, the guy who was in detention the whole time ended up doing education. And taking these three bits of experience of working in digital advertising, running entertainment businesses, and becoming a kind of teacher and educator uh, I realized there was a really interesting opportunity to blend these things together into a learning company, which is called Wavetable. So Wavetable is built on three principles. Real things happen, which we're going to be getting into today. Ideally, just like Remote Daily, you can't wait for the next episode. And there's always different ways to engage with different topics. So often a lot of education is one way to engage with one topic. I believe there's actually lots of different ways to engage. And that's what we're going to be getting into a bit today. So we do lots of different stuff. I've worked with lots of big companies, lots of kind of scale ups, lots of entrepreneurial communities. I love working with like closely connected communities. This is one, so I'm really happy to be here. Um, let's get into what's happening with us. We're doing, we do studio works, we build stuff with companies, we co create things. We also run this thing called Workshop Creator. That's kind of the theme of today's session. So we actually run like a six week version of this program. It's a six week interactive program all running on Zoom. We just finished our last cohort in May. Today's session is a version of that program. It's the Workshop Creator Express Express. The Workshop Creator Express is about 90 minutes. Today is the Express Express, it's 45 minutes. So we're taking six weeks, packing it into 45 minutes. So it's gonna be quick, it's gonna be hands-on, it's gonna be interactive. I'm gonna try and just give you as much good stuff as we possibly can. It's all from our session that we run with our bigger programs. So, a workshop on workshops. What on earth is that? That sounds a bit meta. Um, the way I like to think about this is building blocks to transform expertise into experiences. So, a lot of the things people mentioned in the chat, probably you have expertise in, you're very curious about, you're interested in, how do we take this expertise, these ideas, and these passions and turn them into something experiential? That's what a workshop on workshops is really all about. So. We have four mindsets in our bigger program. Thinking, like a workshop creator, designing, developing, and delivering, like a workshop creator. Today, because we're just a short session, we're gonna do two of those. We're gonna focus in on designing, like a workshop creator, and delivering. So the design part and the facilitation part. That's what we're gonna be focusing on. We're gonna do that in a couple of different ways. Um, 
you do these in two sprints. So each one, design, facilitation, be a little sprint. The sprint breaks down like this. There's actually only two parts. It's not really a breakdown when there's only two bits. There's going to be a content bit, which is me sharing my screen, sharing some of the things I've discovered so far. And then we're going to be going into breakouts. So Grace will be putting everybody into breakout rooms, we'll be working in little teams to start practicing the skills, exploring some of the things we're talking about. That's how it's going to work. Oh, okay. I'm going to take a breath because we're going to go straight into sprint number one. I told you it was going to be quick. Sprint number one of two. Sprint number two is going to be facilitation. This one is design. It's about designing like a workshop code. How do we design these interactive workshops? I'm going to do this through three scenes. Well, I like to break this down, sort of thinking a bit like a movie producer. Much easier to remember when we've got nice scenes we can break them down into. This sprint has got three scenes. Scene number one is learning outcomes. Scene number two is structure. And scene number three is formats. So we're going to get into scene number one, designing. We're going to be thinking about how do we do a learning outcome? Um, now, if you've done lots of workshop stuff before, great. Um, hopefully this will add a little bit more to your toolbox. If it's something new, hopefully it's something fresh and new way of thinking about stuff. So thinking about an outcome of any workshop. Now, whether you're running a workshop that is very kind of learning focused or is more kind of exploratory, this idea of outcomes are really, really important. The best way to think about an outcome is what they can do at the end of the session that they couldn't do before. There's loads and loads of science on this, but this is a, this kind of way of thinking about it. What can people do at the end of your session that they couldn't do before? And having outcomes is so important because I've seen it where I've had this before, not having clear things that people can do, we end up designing something that doesn't really work and people leave dissatisfied. So this is one way of thinking. I find this sentence very, very helpful. But what does it actually mean? How do we surface this? So the 101 on learning outcomes. For a workshop you're designing, you don't want to have more than three outcomes. If you have 10, it's going to be extremely hard to fulfill all the outcomes. You want an outcome to have one sentence, just one sentence. And we want to have a single clear action verb. So a doing word, it's all about what people can do. Maximum three, one sentence each, single clear action verb. So what does this look like in practice? Um, Good way of thinking about this is this little model, explain, apply, or create. So if we're thinking about how do we write this one sentence, if you think about your topic, whatever you're working on, what are people able to explain after the session? What are they able to apply after the session? What are they able to create after the session? You can probably think there's loads of other verbs you could associate, but these three are really, really helpful to sort of frame what the outcomes are. An example of this. Uh, I've been doing a lot of cooking during lockdown. Some of it's been, it's been a varying success, but a, a workshop I would love to do actually is how to make marvelous mushroom soup. I don't know what these mushrooms are. I just found these online. So don't go and pick these. But if we wanted to do a marvelous mushroom soup workshop, some of the outcomes we might have, if we put them into our three categories, might be a bit like this. So our explain outcome might be describe. You'll be able to describe the method for making marvelous mushroom soup. That would be an explain outcome. An apply outcome might be let's go into a group together and we'll talk about some stuff and then you get feedback from your teammates and then you can integrate that feedback. So you can apply that feedback into your recipe. Add more salt, add more cream, less mushrooms, whatever it is. Maybe if it's a create outcome, we might say at the end of this session, you'll be able to design packaging for a new flavor of soup. You'll be able to create something brand new. So it's super simple. People often get stuck with this learning outcome stuff because it feels quite complex. But if we just break it down into these, Simple three categories, we'll start to see these nice, clear, one sentence things show up. Okay, so there is loads of science on learning outcomes, but look, a lot of schools, classes are canceled. We don't have that much time today. So unfortunately, Dr. Beaker is gonna to have to be on pause. There's lots of science, uh, but one other quick bit on this, which I just wanted to share. Good way of thinking about an outcome, if you're not sure, is what are you trying to convince your audience of? So if you think about, I've got this, this thing I feel really strongly about. It could be mushroom soup. It could be something around diversity. It could be storytelling. It could be songwriting, whatever it is. What are you trying to convince people of when they come to your session? So for my mushroom soup example, it might be that mushroom soup is much more versatile than you think. So if I'm trying to convince people, it's not boring. It's actually quite exciting. It's quite interesting. It's quite varied. This idea of what you're trying to convince people of can lead you to lots of interesting outcomes and lots of interesting maybe activities and things you could do in your session. So this is a powerful question. What are you trying to convince your audience of? Okay, that was scene one. Let's move to scene two. Structure. Oof. Okay, so workshops aren't A to B. 
linear path. They're non-linear, adaptive, flexible. There's all sorts of stuff and chaos that goes on. How do we manage this? How do we manage the order and the chaos when we're not doing a linear thing, we're doing something that's much more exploratory, it can feel scary having this chaotic bit. How do we link the order and the chaos? Here are a couple of tips. So we've got our start point, our end point, our A and our B, our start of our workshop, our desired outcome at the end. Here's a simple model to help you figure it out. So if we start our workshop with some opening stuff, we might have an introduction, some content at the beginning. In the middle bit, where all this creative, collaborative, chaotic stuff happens, that's where all the activities and discussion happen. And then at the end of the workshop, we're going to close it with maybe some more content, some reflection. This session is exactly that. I'm opening with some content. You're going to go and explore in just a minute. And then we're going to come back and do a bit of closing. So this looks so simple, but just applying this nice little model to the way your session is can make it so much easier to break down. The magic bit about this open, explore, close idea is that it chunks down into smaller pieces too. And I've used this for like five minute bits as much as a full day. It can be really powerful. So for example, let's say we're doing a one hour workshop. We can break it down into four bits of 15. And each of those has got an open, explore, and close. Open, explore, and close. Open, explore, and close, and so on. Today's session is just like that. We have two sprints. So we're doing two of these open, explore, close. Two sprints, each one is about 15 minutes long. So you can use this for an entire day, or you could use it for 10 minutes, or you could use it for an hour. It's a really useful model. Just open, explore, close. What's going on in each of those bits helps you manage the chaos, keep some order around everything that's going on. So the power of chunking. I love food, what can I say? Some tasty chocolate. Chunking things down is really, really powerful because I see so often people get overwhelmed trying to put everything they know in their brain into a workshop. If you chunk it down, it helps so much. And that's one model you can use. <sighs> okay. Number three, formats. Um, so if workshops are for building expertise, which many workshops tend to be, we're going to be building some sort of expertise or knowledge of some kind. We're probably going to be building knowledge, probably going to be building some skills, probably going to be developing some wisdom, some experience throughout our session. There are lots of ways we can do this. So we might have like lecture content. This is kind of lecture content. We're going to have discussions. So we've got a discussion in just a second. We might have a Q&A, which I'm sure there's been in other shows with Ramon David. We might have a hands-on thing. We're actually like making stuff together. We might do like a role play scenario thing. There's lots of different formats we can use, whether online or in person. The most important part with the formats though is matching them up. So lectures are really good for knowledge, for sharing knowledge and idea and information. Lectures are really good. But if you wanted to learn how to ride a bicycle, a lecture probably isn't gonna help you very much. You need to get hands on to understand how balance works and your body shape and understand the feeling of the bike. A lecture's not gonna to work too well. Likewise, a scenario thing wouldn't necessarily be a great way of building knowledge. You actually want some kind of structural information and some data to work with. So thinking about the way that your formats actually fit together and what you're trying to do for people is really, really important. So matching your formats and the thing you want to develop in people, matching these together. One other quick bit before we get into our breakout. Uh, this is one of my favorite obscure records, but that's not the point. Um, this is probably the most important thing from today, the idea of energy. Now, one of the things that I see particularly online, but in person too, with the formats you're using, whether it's Q&A, discussion, lecture, hands-on, scenario stuff, whatever it is, try and change it every 30 minutes if you're in person. If you're online, cut it in two. So every 15 minutes, change it. And it could just be we'll insert a QA. and a We're going to have a discussion. We're going to have the band play. We're going to do something different. We're going to have a guest. Having that rotation helps the energy stay high rather than low. You want an energy flash, not an energy crash. So the rotation of format is really, really helpful. All you need to do is just adjust the format that you're delivering your session in. That's all you need to do. Okay, let's get into a breakout. So three takeaways. We want active one sentence outcomes for what people can do at the end of the session. We want to manage our chaos and order in little chunks. We can use these chunks for 10 minutes or 20 minutes or an hour, whatever it will be. And we can mix and match our formats together. All right, I'm going to pause my sharing so we're going to get into a breakout the breakout is going to look a little bit like this um, 
what we'd like you to do in a breakout. Grace will put you into groups in just a second. Quick introduction. Who are you? Where are you? A quick 30 second intro. Who are you? Where are you? What do you do? A brief bit about your workshop topic. If you don't have one, that's okay. It can just be a theme or a topic really broadly that you're interested in. Skateboarding, songwriting, headphones, wine, whatever it is. And then think about this question. What are you trying to convince your audience of? What is it about this topic that really matters to you? What is the learning that you would love people to be convinced by and go, oh, that's the breakthrough, that's the thing I needed. So quick intro, your topic, and the one thing you're trying to convince your audience of. I'm gonna stop sharing um, as we go into the breakout. Screen number one, super quick, but hopefully you just got a couple of little ideas, a couple of little sparks, and we're not gonna be able to design an entire program today in the space of the time we've got, but hopefully a couple of little kind of things started to catalyze and spark in your imaginations, thinking about what you would like to convince your audience of. So we're gonna jump straight in to our second sprint. Our second sprint is delivery, the facilitation bit. So I'm gonna share my screen once more. Hopefully I can get a two out of two success rate on the sharing, let's see. Yes, it's green. Okay, straight into it. This one's gonna be quick and we're going straight into a breakout. So this idea of delivering, how do we deliver a workshop? This can feel a bit scary, particularly if we're kind of new to it, we're doing it on Zoom, there's lots of people or it's a topic we're not familiar with. Just gonna give you a few tips of how we can start thinking about this stuff. So two scenes in this one. First one is just gonna be a couple of bits on fundamentals fundamentals of facilitation, a bit of an alliteration. And then a couple of bits on session delivery, a couple of quick tips. Again, in the bigger programs we run, we have way, way, way more stuff on this, but here's a few handy bits to get us going. So, scene number one, some fundamentals. So we like to think of workshops as having three flavors. I really should have included some ice cream flavors here because, well, there's the food, the food references have got to keep coming. But I think about workshops in kind of three flavors and you might mix and match flavors just like you can with ice cream. The three flavors are the strategist. So we've got a workshop, we're trying to get to an insight of some sort, a breakthrough, maybe a new idea in the company, something like that. We might have maybe a, an operator, maybe a kind of alignment flavor of workshop. Maybe we're working with our team to maybe resolve a conflict or come to some consensus on something perhaps. And the third flavor, which is the one that I tend to do more of, is this idea of education. So we're looking to learn something. So we're sharing some information and helping people build skills. Again, you can mix these together and these different flavors do have different kind of facilitation styles, different content, different development methods, but they do all have some similarities when it comes to facilitation. And this idea of facilitation, the work can feel a bit, a bit kind of fluffy sometimes, but one definition that I really like is this one from Terence Metz. Um, a facilitator is a leader who creates an environment where every participant has the opportunity to collaborate, innovate, and excel. I think this is great and it's really empowering because often we can think, oh, I'm running a workshop, I need to know everything, I'm on the stage in front of everyone, I've got to be the expert, I can't not know anything, I have to have all the answers, I've got to make sure this is working and that's working, this is working, nothing goes wrong. In fact, all we're doing is creating an environment for other people to do great stuff. And that's actually quite an empowering message rather than us thinking we have to know everything and remember everything or what if the Zoom breakout rooms don't work and we go into a panic. All we're doing is creating an environment. So I think this is a really empowering message. Um, one way I like to think about planning my sessions is with this little two by two. So again, depending on your flavor, this might vary. I'm just gonna put a couple of things up here. So we've got passive to active on the horizontal, energetic reflective on the vertical. So here's a bunch of stuff. Um, things that we might do. So you might want to use this for your own session. Think about where you are on this. You might have it for your session as a whole, or you might have it for different things you're doing. So for example, top right, telling a story, I'm probably going to be more energetic and I'm going to be waving my hands around and all that kind of good stuff. Meanwhile, if we're running a breakout, we're opening up some challenging space, maybe it's a difficult topic people to talk about, bottom left. As a facilitator, I'm going to be more passive, far more reflective. It's not about me, it's about the group. I'm going to be listening closely, I'm going to be reflective. Again, if we're checking in during an activity, we might be more active, but we might be a bit more reflective we'll make sure there's that space. So this two by two can be really helpful. And why this can be really helpful is because adjusting our energy and our vibes and our, and our feeling based on the needs of the room. And it, it's a little bit tricky when we're doing it online, but there's still some of these tales and these reads we can have. We can sense what's the energy, what's the feeling, 
we can adjust our energy accordingly because if just like the energy flash for us, if we're running like this all the time, we're going to crash. Not good for anybody. And again, online, I would adjust this a bit. I don't usually wave my hands around quite this much, but because we use, lose a bit of this expressiveness online, I will amp it up to 20. And I very, I'm six foot six, I have very long arms, so I can stretch them out. So whatever works for you, I'd amp it by 20% or so. So those are just a couple of fundamentals of facilitation just to get us thinking about environment and passive and active. A couple of tips on session delivery. Um, if you are designing a workshop, allow five times the design time versus delivery at a minimum, absolute minimum. Uh, this one, even though it's a short one, was eight times. So this was eight times the design time for me to deliver a 45 minute session today. Um, can be much higher. I actually have a very long blog post on this. So if you Google my name and like workshop multiplier or something, workshop equations, I think you'll find a whole long thing I've written about this. But often I see people underestimate the fact, the ratios between these things. If you spend loads of time in the design phase, the delivery gets much, much easier. Much, much easier. So definitely allow at least five times. Um, the nerves, the fear, the overwhelm. This is real. I still get this from time to time. This can be a real feeling if we're up on stage or in a virtual room running a thing for a bunch of people, it can feel scary. I have a lot of different tips on this. Here's one that I found really helpful. This is the one that's probably the most helpful thing for me over doing 200 and something workshops in the last few years, checkpoints. So let's go back to that mushroom soup workshop. I, I know you can't wait to sign up for that. It's gonna be incredible. Top here, we've got some content, right? We've got some intros, we've got some lecture, we've got some Q&A, we've got, so these are our formats and our stuff that's going on, our content and an activity. And we've got time at the bottom, so like zero to 50 minutes. If I go with this as it is, I am going flat out for, for, for 40 minutes. I have to do the intro bit. I've got some lecture stuff. Uh, there's gonna be some Q&A for me, then I do another lecture bit, then I get to the activity and everyone goes off and does their activity. I am gonna be exhausted and I have no space to check in with Grace or Felix or whoever else I'm co-running the session with. It's gonna be really difficult. I'm much more exposed to being problems and being not being able to deliver and create that environment I wanna create. So instead, what I do is I put something in here. It doesn't need to be much. In this case, it might be a little pair conversation. Right, three minutes in pairs, talk about the thing we just talked about. What this does for me, well, it gets, firstly, it's more interactive for the group because they're doing stuff. But for me, it cuts down that flat out time. I had a 40 minutes down to 80. And so at that point, that three minutes gives me the space to just say, hey, Grace, how's it going? What do you think? Do we need to change anything? Is the mic level okay? Anything we need to adjust? What should we do better next time? Whatever it is. Just that three minutes to check in with myself, check in with other people, makes the whole experience better for everybody. So adding a little checkpoint for yourself somewhere, really helpful. I used to try and have to remember like hours of content and hours of stuff. In fact, just adding one little thing made it so much easier. Last thing is the facilitator loop. Um, I love this. So really, facilitation is generally saying, here's what we're gonna do. Here's what we're doing as we're doing it. And then, oh, here's what we just did. Again, it's the open, explore, close. Here's what we're gonna do. Here's what we're doing. Here's what we just did, summarizing. And so we just go around this loop, making sure that everyone's heard it, everyone knows what's going on, making sure everyone's feeling okay. It feels weird at first that we're just saying the same thing again and again, but actually just following this loop a couple of times for each of your little chunks, really, really helpful. All right, told you it was a quickie. Three takeaways. Find your stance. So use that little two by two. Think about where you are. Are you active? Are you reflective? Are you passive? Are you active? Whatever it is and where, where that's gonna change during your session. Match the energy, match your energy with the needs of the room. So depending on the type of session you're doing, how the audience is, what the vibe is, what the feeling is, and use these checkpoints and use this loop to help guide you through the process. Okay, gonna go into a breakout in just a sec. We'll pop this into the chat. You might only get time for one of these, but the first question is, which part of your workshop topic, whatever that may be, do you think could be most challenging for you? So it could be anything from like putting people into rooms to knowing what I'm going to say at the beginning. Uh, in my mushroom workshop, I might be explaining chemical properties of mushrooms without like freaking people out. That might be something. The second question is what's one thing, just one thing you could do to address this challenge. Maybe ask your teammates for some support. So for me, it might be, I might send out 
a PDF or some flashcards or something to people before the workshop, just to say, hey, here's, here's some of the chemical properties we're going to be talking about today. Or I could just do a quick run through with my friends to see, hey, do you get, do you get this? Does that make sense? Really simple. So which thing could be most challenging for you? What's one thing you can do to help overcome the overwhelm? All right, I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, I'm going to pop this into the chat. Oh, Grace is she's all over it. All over it. Love it. Thank you. So which part of your topics could be most challenging for you? One thing you could do to address the challenge. And again, we're working in teams, so get some feedback from your team, get some support, get some help. Um, if you need any assistance, just hit the little ask for help uh, button at the bottom of your Zoom controls and one of us will be whisked magically into your room. Uh, I think we're gonna do a quick, well, this will probably be like a six minute, six minute quick breakout, just a minute or two each, just to share that. Let's go. 